And with that, I would like to introduce Heather Kirkering, who is our science coordinator at PICAP. It's been a pleasure working with Heather over the last couple of years uh, since she joined us. Um, she'll be your moderator for these research and management lightning talks. Um, Heather is, an active, is active in a number of state and regional climate committees and programs and enjoys creating opportunities to apply climate adaptation science. Some of you may know that before joining PICAST, um, Heather worked across government, academic, nonprofit, and industry sectors to apply the latest in science and technology to pressing environmental and climate issues. And that includes, um, included her work with um, the Pacific Islands Ocean Observing System at UH Manoa in, in a few years past. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and pass it to Heather and we'll jump into our research and management lightning talk. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'm excited to moderate the last session of the first day of our Science Summit. We have seven speakers lined up for you. Um, the speakers will go for about eight minutes and then we'll have about two minutes after each presentation for some Q&A. So about 10 minutes total for each one. Um, they're kind of grouped into changing plant communities, changing landscapes, fire and drought, or marine and freshwater ecosystems. I'd also like to acknowledge the diversity of, of partnership that we have in our Lightning um, speakers, from federal partnerships to our friends in Guam and at UH Hilo, um, the Park Service and other university um, programs. So thank you all for participating. Um, first up, we are going to have Lucas Fortini. Lucas Fortini is a USGS ecologist with the Pacific Island Ecosystem Research Center with expertise in quantitative methods, including simulation and spatial modeling to make conservation and management efforts more science-based. His applied conservation research has focused on large integrative efforts to understand how species and ecosystems, ecosystem response, responds to stress shape opportunities for conservation and management. His recent research, research has focused on determining the impacts of climate change on Pacific Island ecosystems and interactions with current serious threats, including invasives and land cover change. So now take it away, Lucas. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to present today. So I actually came here to Hawaii almost exactly 10 years ago to work for the USGS under the Pacific Islands Ecosystems Research Center to work precisely on the impacts of climate change on island ecosystems. And a lot of my work has indeed been focused on plant communities, but I also snuck in the forest birds because we all love them and they're also really top priority for conservation here in Hawaii. So um, next slide, please. Yeah, so over the years I have been part of the now dissolved Pacific Islands Climate Change uh, Cooperative, the Pixie. I also have closely worked with the PICASC as well. But most importantly, I have interacted with the many federal, state, NGO, and private partners across the islands to try to provide science that helps climate adaptation of conservation efforts across Hawaii. So through that time, it has really been an honor, honor to see the entire conservation community rising to the challenge of uh, learning about climate change and starting really making concrete steps towards adaptation. So today, I'm just gonna give a, a really quick overview about how some of these research efforts have uh, evolved over time with the, or through these partnerships uh, as the conservation community itself has changed over these many years. So uh, next, please. So about uh, back 10 years ago, climate change was still something quite new in the conservation community here in Hawaii. So at that stage, research that we conducted was really about getting the conservation community to engage with the topic, to really start understanding the science, the risks and the vulnerabilities uh, of the systems they care for. So because of that, we ended up doing a lot of uh, efforts that were focused on engaging broad parts of the com uh, conservation community to get, uh, so we could identify top concerns and uh, address them. So that's why our, some of the first research that we conducted was like the sweeping broad assessments of vulnerability of all native plants and forest bird species across Hawaii with respect to climate change. So those efforts mostly focused on potential future impacts of, impacts of climate change, but they still serve to give managers a pretty concrete idea of potential, uh, potential impacts. And they have really been used uh, uh, quite uh, 
uh, broadly in terms of like species listing. Uh, and they have been used to also to push for consideration of novel forest bird conservation options, seed banking priorities, and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So as those vulnerabilities became clear, we really needed to move beyond just understanding those risks and really start understanding the mechanisms of those potential responses and really start trying to explore the viability of pot potential solutions. Uh, in clear terms, we really just did not need more studies that gave bad news, but we needed science that helped people to deal with the problem. So one example of such uh, research was the Haleakala Silverstore demographic study where we combined almost 40 years of demographic data with climate change, with environmental change uh, in Maui to really get an understanding about how the demography of the species was changing across space and time and how that gave opportunities for management of the species. Uh, next, please. Uh, the other thing we did regarding that was also looking at, uh, starting looking at some novel uh, um, conservation options, such as looking at the viability, ecological viability for assisted colonization for critically endangered and, and endangered uh, species. Um, next, please. So uh, more recently, our research has been more about on the ground practical decision making. Um, and that comes with the realization that we really don't have to think about the end of century to think about climate impacts because climate change is happening now and it has actually been happening for several past decades. And part of that uh, involves trying to bring climate change into short term de uh, decision making and planning. So for instance, we developed with colleagues uh, a web portal that gives a real-time assessment of risk of avian malaria to uh, um, uh, forest bird communities that are of high value across the state so managers can eventually be able to do targeted vector control actions to minimize those risks. Um, next. But also the other aspect of supporting on the ground adaptation is really to start helping managers to prioritize effort under these uncertain times. Because simply telling that there's a problem and there's a, gonna be an impact and they have to do more on top of everything that they already have to care for is just not very useful. And we really have to start uh, help them prioritize the actions in places where perhaps they can have the best long-term consequences to the, tar the conservation targets they have. Uh, next, please. So overall, like as I look back to all these years of uh, research, uh, there's been certainly uh, a, an increasing pattern of us researchers and managers really thinking more about what is the past and ongoing shift and not really having to rely on long-term projections to see how we best can act today. Next. Uh, also shifting again from trying to just understand potential impacts to really think about viability of solutions and developing actual tools for managers to effectively uh, allocate their uh, limited resources. And next. And then overall, it's just been, as I mentioned before in the beginning, it just has been this continuous uh, increase in engagement between researchers and managers. Whereas before when, you know, 10 years ago when I started this, it was all about trying to address questions and concerns raised by managers. But now it's really about a process of co-production, which has been just a, 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 an honor to be part of uh, so far. Uh, next. So just to wrap up some of the, uh, uh, I guess some of my random thoughts about challenges and opportunities for uh, this type of research uh, from here on out. In terms of scientific challenges, I think thinking beyond mean shift is still something we really have to tackle. Um, we all know, for instance, a bad El Nino year has really drastic consequences to coral bleaching and so forth. But I think for terrestrial ecosystems, you know, in terms of drought, in terms of vector movement across the landscape and disease, we can probably have those extreme event consequences that have very long lasting consequences in the ecosystems we care for. Climate and, and invasives, of course, is a major topic of uncertainty that you're combining two things that are highly uncertain in your loss across the landscape and trying to have an understanding about how those may interact now and in the future. Um, and here in Hawaii, just the, uh, you know, you know, ecosystem processes are largely uh, determined by available water and just the uncertainty of where rainfall 
uh, how rainfall may behave in the future, that's a major challenge. And lastly, it's just we have so many species and so many things of concern, and we really have to think about it effectively. How do we provide information that scales up to the broader set of uh, species uh, possible? Uh, next. Uh, I think that is still, there's still plenty of, uh, uh, let's say, research niche for people to start thinking about what are some of the new uh, tool, uh, tools that we can add to the conservation toolbox here in Hawaii. Um, because the climate is changing, conservation is changing, we should have also uh, you know, a revised tool set for conservation to address these uh, changing times. Um, next. And then, uh, as mentioned before, just telling that there's a problem and that people have to be concerned about something is very limited in a place such as the Pacific where we have, we're so resource constrained for man, conservation and management that helping managers adapt those shifting priorities is a, is a critical need. Uh, lastly, yes. So, uh, and then I guess the broader uh, uh, um, issue that I think we can address better and better over time is just integrating you know, some of these uh, work that focuses on uh, ecological impacts of climate change with the broader set of uh, impacts that we expect from climate change. We know, for instance, we are also islands that are highly vulnerable ec economically and so forth, infrastructure-wise from climate change and starting to integrate those impacts is really important. But I, I don't think it's all bad as Kavika and I think others will mention you know, this next couple of days, uh, it, it also uh, uh, provides a great opportunity for uh, engagement and other approaches that can be highly successful in uh, really sponsoring great uh, and a successful climate change adaptation. So I think that's all I have. Yes, okay. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I did want to remind people that they can answer uh, input questions into the Q&A box. Um, if you would like to ask the presenter a question, we will have a couple of minutes after each speaker. Um, let's see, I do have one question. Um, can you comment on some of the novel conservation actions you have in mind? Sorry, yeah, uh, so I think um, some of them are, you know, such as the one we have explored before, assisted colonization is, I, 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 it's a pretty important one for us to consider, especially when it comes to plants where we know that a lot of the native plant species have lost their dispersers and so forth. And we also have a matrix, uh, a, 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 a ecosystem matrix that makes it very hard for them to move around as they probably did before. So, you know, in our past analysis, of the, those vulnerabilities of plant species here in Hawaii, we show that a lot of species today, over a hundred species, uh, by end of century, uh, where they occur now is out of their climatical optima, meaning that they're probably not going to be so happy. And most of those species are species that, again, just do not disperse that readily across the landscape. So we start having to think about that. Uh, I think that you know, in terms of the birds, there's the issue of um, uh, you know, the novel vector control and not uh, novel ways of dealing with the disease um, that I think is pretty important. Um, and yeah, but I think those are the main ones that I think we have to look as they're, um, yeah, they, they are pretty critical, but there are many other ones, of course. Great. Thank you, Lucas Fortini, um, for your insights and your presentation. We are, um, and for being on time, that was really great. <laughs> so next up, we have Dr. Elliot Parsons. Um, Dr. Elliot Parsons it has a PhD in fish and wildlife biology from the University of Montana. Now as the Pu'u'awa coordinator with the Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife, he leads conservation and restoration actions to benefit Hawaii's threatened dryland forest in North Dakota. And he supervises a crew of on-site staff dedicated to the management of state lands as part-time lecturer in wildlife science at UH Hilo, one of our consortium universities. Elliot teaches classes on wildlife biology, population ecology, and conservation science for the College of Forestry, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Management and the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science oh. Program. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Parsons, and take it away. Hello, Heather, and um, uh, 
A uh, huge mahalo as well to Mary Vaughn, Darren, and Brad for the invitation to speak. Um, and I, I have to um, just give a quick shout out to Dr. Fortini for that amazing uh, background with the, the dinosaurs in the background. That was, that was pretty awesome. Um, so I work for the Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife at Pu'uwa'awa -a as a natural resource manager. Um, next. And um, it, it is an incredible place to work, uh, incredible ecosystem and, and actually many ecosystem types. Um, we have a variety of, of native species, some of which are endemic to Hawaii Island uh, and some even only found here at the forest reserve. Um, uh, on the bottom, just a few examples of the native Ma'ohao Hele, Kokio, Halopepe, and the um, uh, Solan and Min Completum. Um, next. Um, and we know uh, there are a lot of threats um, to these native ecosystems that we're trying to protect. Um, I've seen a lot of these um, over the last 10 years or so that I've been here. Wildfire has been a big one. And the upper left is a wildfire that was uh, about three years ago and burned a couple thousand acres below Highway 190. That's a willy willy tree right in the middle. Um, drought, ecological drought is a pretty big deal. Um, and uh, ungulates as well, um, feral sheep and goats and pigs, uh, bark stripping and trampling and browsing has a big impact. Um, invasive pests and pathogens, it seems like every year or two or three, we have some new uh, big pest that's running amok and, and destroying our native forests. Um, invasive plants are of course a big deal. Um, uh, this is tree tobacco uh, covering a road in the bottom middle. And often what ends up happening is we end up with um, uh, remnant native trees, such as in the lower right, um, Halapepe and Aiea, which are hanging on by a thread and surrounded by um, uh, hundreds of acres of non-native uh, flammable grasses. Next. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that native plant communities are disappearing, plant communities are changing rapidly um, due to these multiple threats, and in particular that's especially true for tropical dry forests, of which over 95 percent of those Original tropical dry forests have disappeared in Hawaii. Next. Um, and um, I want to mention that we do know how to deal with many of those threats uh, as natural resource managers. Uh, and this is what we're working on every day. So for example, fire fuel breaks and vegetation management for wildfires, um, invasive species removal. Um, outplanting. So for the plants that are disappearing, propagating them and creating safe places for them and planting them out in the ecosystem. Um, uh, trying to deal with invasive pests, uh, fencing, conservation fencing. So this uh, picture in the lower right shows, uh, you know, one of our many ungulate um, exclusion fences on top of the Puawa cone with inside the fence on the left and outside on the right. Next. So challenges, um, one of the big challenges that we have is data and needing a lot of data, needing to know where things are, what's the distribution and abundance of the areas we're trying to protect. Uh, and so one of the um, projects that we embarked on was to work with Carnegie Airborne Observatory, now with Arizona State, to try to map and classify uh, some of the native trees at Puawa Forest Reserve. So we did this over a couple of years. The map in the lower right shows the project area um, with Puawa Forest Reserve and Puanahulu next door to the right. And uh, the area was flown by the fixed wing aircraft a couple times, uh, most recently around 2016. Uh, and that's the data that we used. And we went out and did field surveys and geo-referenced tree crowns of a bunch of different species and then used computer learning to um, help identify those trees on the landscape. And these are um, pictures and maps uh, that um, I've gotten from uh, Dr. Chris Balzotti. Next. And this is just an example showing um, what some of that data looks like. These are also from, uh, from Chris. 
Um, the green shows Koa, uh, and that's that uh, picture on the Pu'u that I showed you a minute ago and showing that reforested area. The yellow is silver oak, um, and then we've got a few other different colors, different species there. Um, and so just getting this data to get a handle of 104,000 acres of Pu'uwa'wa and Pu'anahulu, so we can try to find out where the native forest is, where species are, so that we can protect them the best we can. Next. Um, other, other questions um, is, um, Kind of what uh, what do we want the forest to look like uh, next? So um, I, I got the question up there, and I think it's a really important one to address. So as Mary Vaughn mentioned earlier, science is a tool, and, and science can do a great job of telling us what past plant communities were, um, what existing threats are, and the effects on plant communities. Maybe even projections of what future plant communities might look like. But I think that we really need to think carefully and hard about what we want the uh, forest to look like in the future and to have a strong vision moving forward that um, in a large part is community driven and based on um, the values and motivations of, um, of our stakeholders and our agencies and, and their missions. Next. Uh, a big challenge and opportunity is how can management be more community driven? Um, that I think has been um, a large uh, hole uh, in conservation for a long time. And we've got some great marine examples. I'll show another example in a second, um, but I think that's another challenge and opportunity that we really need to um, bring the community in and have community values help drive what we want those forests to look like in the future. Next. And then how do we train the next generation? Um, we have all of these uh, challenges and part of climate adaptation should be in having um, adaptable uh, managers and adaptable conservationists. So from an education standpoint, we can think about, well, what, what would we need to do to train people to have that kind of a flexibility to really, um, uh, really pivot when they need to in the future next? So here is an example of a community um, project that we have happening in Pu'uwa'awa. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Katie Kamelamela for this slide. Um, the Pu'u community-based forest subsistence area was started around 2017, and it calls upon the parties working together to work towards uh, achieving health and well-being of Pu'uwa'awa and the Kaya'ulu, um, the community, by means of the Pu'u community forest area. And you can see that area outlined in red on top of the Pu'awa cone, which is about an 84 acre area. Next. And we've got a lot of um, great partners and leads. And so for our project leads, Ku'ule Kehalani, um, Hannah Kehalani Springer and Ulu Ching, um, we have lineal descendants uh, next. And a lot of project supporters next. Um, and so I'm wrapping up um, and I can have this as my last slide, but I think one of our big challenges is how do we get the community back to the land um, so they can help inform the direction um, so that we can more successfully adapt to future climate changes. Mahalo Nui. Thank you so much, Dr. Parsons um, and for being on time, let's see. So, um, we had one question come in that I would like to ask you. Um, what is the dry forest TUI and how does it factor into your efforts? Uh, sure, the dry forest TUI uh, was a group started um, quite a few years ago now um, by some initial partners on the dry side um, of the Big Island. Uh, and in particular, a call out to Ka'upalehu Dry Forest Preserve, um, Waikolo Dry Forest Initiative um, for helping get this going. But it is a collaboration of different dry forest uh, managers and preserves who try to work together monthly, at least um, during non-COVID times, and uh, work on each other's sites to get big projects done with uh, professional staff. And you know, it makes a huge difference when you have, for example, a, a 
small couple hundred acre preserve with a couple staff people and you get 25 well-trained staff showing up uh, they're able to do just amazing projects and help us protect our native species and ecosystems um, so that's been a great um, a great partnership over the years Great, thank you. Um, another uh, question for you is, are you using observational data from the users of the Community Forest Preserve? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have um, meetings that range from monthly to every two or three months. And as part of those monthly meetings, um, we talk about our observations of the land and what we notice and everybody uh, goes around. Uh, it's part of the what we call the Hui Nui, which is our large group of folks that are part of the Pu'u community-based forest subsistence area. Um, and so it's something that we can definitely do a lot more of, but it's something that we've been trying to work into our, our monthly practice with this group. Um, and I think it's been highly, highly useful and highly beneficial. All right. Um, Seeing no other questions right now, I just want to thank you for your really fantastic presentation and um, getting at all of those questions we kind of uh, set up for you and really learning more about the, the work that you're doing there. And I hope that the students that you're able to reach uh, through your the classes you teach and the work you're doing can help um, continue this adaptation effort in the Forest Reserve. So thank you so much. Mahalo, Heather. Next up, we have uh, Patrick Keeler. Patrick Keeler is a watershed coordinator in Guam. He has worked as the watershed coordinator for the Guam Bureau of Statistic Statistics and Plans Coral Reef Conservation Program since March of 2017. He is currently working on modifying Guam forestry's existing outplanting protocols to increase plant survivorship and overall health. Thanks for joining us today and go ahead. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, so as stated, I'm a graduate student at the uh, University of Guam for the Safner program. Um, I'm also the watershed coordinator for the Coral Reef Conservation Program, and this is uh, my thesis project that I'll be working on, which is a portion of a um, U.S. forestry biochar grant that was awarded to the Department of Agriculture earlier last year. Next slide, please. Um, as stated, I'm hoping to directly influence um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hoping to directly influence um, actual re resource management on the ground with research. Um, so I'm hoping to modify the existing Government of Guam reforestation protocols at an actual reforestation site with uh, soil remediation techniques that I will be experimenting with um, with this thesis project. Uh, next slide, please. So a quick overview of the project area. It'll be located within the Manal Gais watersheds, uh, which is the southernmost watersheds of Guam. Um, these watersheds are house the uh, southernmost village, uh, Marizo, also known as Moleso. And these watersheds were designated as a habitat blueprint area about five years ago by NOAA because they, they ho they're home to a variety of uh, very important natural resources, such as culturally significant fish species like Mapuchi, uh, turtle nesting grounds, uh, it's a significant fishing community for the island. Uh, there's both seagrass beds and mangroves, as well as a bird sanctuary and one of the five marine preserves found throughout the island, the Aching Reef Flat Marine Preserve is also found within these watersheds. Next slide, please. So these, these natural resources are threatened by a variety of issues, but my, my project itself focuses mostly on the erosion issue. Uh, erosion throughout the South is exacerbated by a variety of problems, but mostly uh, invasive species such as bambusal vulgaris, ungulates. Um, we have fire issues every dry season, um, which are all human set, none are naturally occurring. Another anthropogenic issue we face every, or often is uh, off-roading which can lead to the genesis of badlands, which uh, are very difficult to heal once they've occurred. But the cumulative result of this is a negative impact to both our fresh water and our near shore coastal waters. Um, next slide. I'm hoping to address this impact with biochar. Um, biochar is a carbon rich product produced um, 
when biomass such as wood manure or crop residue is heated in a closed container with little or no available air at a temperature of 600 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it has a variety of helpful uses, such as improving water quality, reducing soil emissions, uh, it can reduce leaching, improve acidic soils, and even reduce irrigation requirements. Um, the latter two lists, or the latter two on this list, are especially important for our natural resource work, on, at least in southern Guam, because our soils are very acidic in the south and can become very dry during our six month dry season. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the two test species I'll be using are Acacia auriculiformis and Terracarpus indicus. Currently, uh, acacia is the favored species or crop species to use for reforestation work by the government or Department of Agriculture. Um, and that's because it's a nitrogen fixer. It is fast growing, so it can compete with the grasses uh, that uh, are found throughout the savanna grass lands. And also, um, it's fire resistant as well. Um, I chose Nara as the other species to test against it because it shares many of these characteristics, such as being a nitrogen fixer, it's fire resistant, um, and it shares a common growth form. Uh, that being said, I'm hoping to introduce this as the uh, more favored of the two because I found resources that state that Nara can, could potentially be a native to um, Guam. And if it's not, it's at least a lot more common to the region in general. Next slide, please. Uh, the project site where this will occur is um, the Asgata Reforestation Site. It's a 100-acre landscape-scale restoration project currently being administered by the Department of Agriculture, Guam Department of Agriculture. Um, as stated, it's primarily acacia, but with interspersed erosion control and native outplantings. You can see on the map uh, two red stars indicating the savanna plots uh, for the project, uh, both of which are 20 by 25 meters. Next slide, please. Sorry. Um, I'll be doing soil sampling on both of the plots. Uh, I'll be taking nine samples each and I'll be measuring pH, organic carbon, cation exchange capacity, as well as the texture. Um, depending on the funding availability, I may be able to contract out a nutrient, a more in-depth nutrient analysis of the soil samples, as well as some of the samples I'll be doing on the next slide. Next slide, please. So I'll be doing soil sampling as well as quality control and testing of biochar. We'll be creating our own biochar out here from a uh, Bambusa bulgaris feedstock um, that we source from another invasive removal project also within the Manel Gaius uh, uh, watersheds. So we're trying to get as much symbiosis as possible between our natural resource projects to um, maximize our uh, efficiency. Um, the biochar will be air dried and ground up into two to three millimeter particles to ensure uniformity. We'll also be purchasing uh, biochar from off island um, in, just in case the biochar we're producing on island isn't um, of sufficient quality because this is the first time that we'll be producing biochar on island for a natural resource project. Uh, the biochar will be subjected to the same test as the soils. And then once that's completed, the biochar and the soil samples will be combined, retested for pH, CEC, texture, and organic carbon uh, four weeks after the combination occurs to determine the effects of biochar on the soils in a lab setting. Um, and then all of these will be done at uh, the OG soil lab. Next slide, please. Um, so just a quick overview of the methodology I'll be utilizing. All of this is adopted from the Department of Agriculture um, uh, planting and nursery protocols. Uh, so the seeds are propagated in double tubes. They'll be fertilized once a week with triple 20, irrigated and grown at the Steady Bay Nursery across from the Department of Agriculture. Uh, for, as far as site prep is involved, there'll be three foot wide rows, spaced six feet apart. Uh, glyphosate will be applied after the initial cut to reduce weed growth. And this is done to uh, increase um, the com competitiveness of our outplanted species against um, the fast growing grasses that are found all throughout the um, uh, savanna grasslands. Next slide, please. We'll also be implementing fire breaks around both the entire landscape scale restoration project site as well as the experimental site itself. Um, the planning will begin in July. We'll be utilizing dibble bars and spacing everything two meters apart, as is uh, current uh, protocol for outplanting. Next slide. For the um, experiment itself, we'll be doing four treatments, uh, control, 
a biochar fertilizer, biochar and fertilizer. Uh, each treatment will get 15 per species. So that'll be a total sample size of 60 per, um, per species being utilized. Uh, fertilizer, when being applied for the fertilizer and biochar uh, and fertilizer, will be given 20 or 50 grams of triple 16 in two holes, so 25 grams each. Um, and then we'll be using a randomized plot um, and we'll be using a computer program to ensure distribution is truly random. Uh, what I failed to mention earlier is that biochar application rates can only be determined after we've uh, tested the soils um, for composition and organic carbon, et cetera, because it'll determine the amount that we're putting in. Next slide, please. Um, so my hypothesis is that the, um, uh, sorry, outplanted species will not show any significant difference in their survival with the addition of biochar versus the alternative that there will be significantly higher survival uh, with biochar than without. And then my second uh, null hypothesis is that the outline of vegetation in southern Guam, badland soils, and savanna soils will have no measurable effect on outplanted tree stem diameter and height versus uh, with the addition of biochar, there will be significant differences in outplanted tree stem diameter and height. Next slide, please. Uh, for monitoring, we'll be doing uh, bi-monthly monitoring. And when I say bi-monthly, I mean once every two months. I'll be measuring the metrics of stem width and height, as well as mortality. Stem width will be measured with calipers uh, of the area where stem meets ground level. Um, and then stem height will be from ground level to stem tip. Monitoring will occur through one full dry and rainy season, so for a full year. And then we'll also be collecting qualitative data on insect damage, plant coloring, weather, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to mention that there will be a biochar workshop on island tentatively scheduled for late spring or early summer, but that all depends on how uh, things shake out with COVID. Um, it'll be open to natural resource managers and partners at University of Guam. Um, and uh, we'll be having an off island consultant specialist come in for a two day workshop. And I'm thinking about actually making it uh, uh, at least a class classroom portion uh, web, like a webinar section as well. So I will be sure to let the um, committee know whether or not that's something that can be opened up to our partners here as well. So thank you. Uh, next slide, sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Keeler. Um, please, if uh, any of the attendees or panelists have any questions, don't forget to put them in the Q&A. This is our time to ask him any questions about the presentation he just gave. Um, so I do have a couple. Uh, let's see, how are the biochar ovens fired or powered? Does the energy use pencil out emissions wise? So we're using kilns that are, uh, have been fabricated on island, and we're going to be uh, using the feedstock, as stated, uh, of the invasive bamboo. So it's just um, a simple kiln that can be moved from site to site. Um, it's not like we're using any accelerants or anything. You can just light it from the bottom, and then uh, once it's ready, you cover it, and then that takes care of the uh, uh, removing of the oxygen or like little to no oxygen. So um, does that answer your question or were you referring to uh, something else in particular? Um, that came in from the audience, so I don't oh, know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe they will chime in on that one. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, um, I did see a question regarding, uh, I thought that NARA was non-native. We've had that discussion uh, out here on Guam as well. Um, I found two resources. I think one's included in my references stating that NARA is um, a native out here, but I've also found multiple saying it's not. That's why I hesitate to include it as being a for sure thing. So until we get a genetic analysis of it, I don't think we can definitively say whether or not it is or isn't. But again, I'm not a specialist in that regard. So I, I don't, I don't want to put my finger in that. 
Yeah, well, thanks for acknowledging uh, that in the in the Q&A too. So uh, I appreciate that. So thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any future questions uh, for uh, Dr. Kuehler, we his information will be included um, in the resources that go out after this workshop. So uh, thank you so much. And we are going to uh, move on to the next speaker where we are now focusing on the, uh, the area of changing landscapes, fire and drought. Um, we have Dr. Abby Frazier. She's a research fellow at the East West Center. She's a climatologist studying drought and climate variability in the Pacific Islands using geospatial methods. She works as a research fellow again at the East West Center and is an affiliate faculty member at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the Department of Geography and Environment. Thank you so much for being here, Abby, and take it away. Great, thanks so much, Heather, for the intro, and thanks so much to PyCask for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm going to try to give a quick overview of uh, all of our drought work <laughs> in the Pacific Islands um, in the next eight minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my work on drought over the last few years has really fallen under two broad objectives. Um, the first has been to characterize drought dynamics in Hawaii and the US affiliated Pacific Islands. So uh, looking at drivers of drought, how drought has changed and what the impacts have been across different sectors. And then the second kind of broad uh, objective of our work has really been to better inform drought decision making and involve managers in the research process. Uh, next slide. So uh, this work is all drawing from a lot of different projects, uh, PyCask work, uh, starting in 2016 with the Hawaii Drought Synthesis, um, where I was working with uh, Christian Giardina at the Forest Service. And then this has expanded into our current work with the Hawaii Drought Knowledge Exchange. Um, so we have a pilot project and a, a scaling up phase, uh, which I'll talk about very shortly. And then we also have some work in Guam, Palau, and Yap that has just started up to work with managers to help mitigate the impacts of drought and wildfire. Next slide, thanks. Uh, so uh, we, you know, to, to look at that first objective, um, we, you know, wanted to understand drought and its impacts across multiple sectors. We know that drought is a natural part of our climate in the Pacific Islands, um, but the impacts can be very severe. Uh, so we looked at meteorological drought, um, and in Hawaii, we've uh, been analyzing a new gridded drought index that you can see um, animating on the screen there uh, that we have from 1920 up to 2012. And in this work, we found that drought frequency, severity, and duration have all increased significantly in the last 100 years in Hawaii. And under meteorological drought, we've also looked at the impacts and linkages uh, between drought and uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. For agricultural drought, we've looked at impacts to uh, farming and ranching. And we've also looked at hydrological drought, so both uh, surface water and groundwater impacts. Um, ecological drought uh, covers any impacts to terrestrial or marine ecosystems. And this includes the impacts of wildfire, uh, as well as drought-induced uh, tree mortality. And then uh, socioeconomic drought is any human dimensions of drought. So this can include drinking water shortages, uh, as well as impacts to public health or tourism or any economic revenue losses. Next slide. So uh, to sort of uh, get it Objective number two, after characterizing you know, as many impacts as we could, we also wanted to look at what actions are being taken by managers on the ground to prepare for and cope with drought. So uh, we published this chapter uh, last year and our uh, author team is a, a mixture of researchers and, and managers to really try to document um, these different management actions in four categories. We looked at uh, water, wildfire, agriculture, and then invasive and native species. Um, and so uh, this, this is a great resource. It really uh, includes a lot of specific examples and case studies on the ground. Um, and you'll notice it's a chapter. It's actually part of a national document. So uh, there are 
all regions across the US represented here. So it's a great resource for how managers across the US are looking at drought and what kinds of actions they're taking on the ground. Next slide. So while we were, you know, kind of compiling all of these different drought actions um, and starting to look at drought decision making, we actually had a lot more questions that came up, um, including, you know, what types of data resources are being used, where people get information, are they, you know, using web resources or are they talking to their neighbors, uh, what types of decisions are being made when it comes to drought, uh, is drought considered when planning new activities, and then what kinds of products are most useful for different sectors. Next slide. So we realize there's a need for uh, a knowledge exchange. So, you know, we know that resource managers want to be more actively engaged in research, um, but they often have limited time and limited training to access information or take large scale results and apply it to a local scale project. Um, and for drought, there's no centralized data clearinghouse. Um, so you really have to know where you're looking to get information. Um, and we needed more formal communication mechanisms between researchers and managers. And uh, more uh, access, easier access to comprehensive data and technical assistance. Next slide. So um, we started up a pilot project to work with three partners in Hawaii, and it's called the Hawaii Drought Knowledge Exchange. And in this pilot, we're working with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, uh, Puvava Forest Reserve, and Mauna Kahalawai Watershed Partnership. And we're working with our partners in these three locations to co-produce these drought portfolios. And this is work that's being led by our postdoc, Ryan Longman at the East West Center. And so he's been helping to produce these site specific um, portfolios for each landscape. So visualizations, statistics, any kind of climate data or relevant data we can get our hands on, um, you know, compiling it all into one place and working with the managers to produce uh, to, to co-produce these different visualizations. Um, and in this project, we're working with a master's student at UH in the NREM department, Melissa Kuntz, who's doing some one-on-one -on -one interviews with managers and uh, helping to do some uh, needs assessment work statewide. So next slide. Uh, so this is sort of an overview of our uh, approach in the Hawaii Drought Knowledge Exchange. So uh, we start, as I mentioned, with some data inputs, so both climate and drought characteristics, any kind of trends or future projections data or other ecology or disturbance data, um, as well as ENSO indices. Um, and these go into these site-specific portfolios that I mentioned. And Ryan now has this process completely automated. Um, so these portfolios, we take them to the managers and we review them. We identify management priorities and data needs with them. And out of this process, we reevaluate the inputs and needs and revise the portfolio. So this iterative approach goes around many times, as Ryan can tell you. And next slide. Through our uh, work with the managers, we're also trying to document drought stories and lessons learned and any research questions, um, and then working with them to co-develop any tools or outputs or anything that we can do that's useful uh, to, to help with drought decision making. Um, and eventually we want to compile cross-site results and build web resources. And you'll hear more uh, soon from Sierra McDaniel on, on this process and the outputs from her end. Um, so next slide. Uh, our next steps with the Hawaii work are to scale up and uh, include 10 additional partners. Um, and the first stage of this work is actually the um, adaptation uh, workbook training course that Katie Steele mentioned earlier with the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. Um, so we're starting this work up in the spring and we're really excited to, to expand out and you know explore more of what um, knowledge co-production means with these partners. And then uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we're doing work in the US API. And I'm sorry, it's crammed into the last slide here. But we're, we're just getting started with this. We're working with a student 
um, of Romina Kings at University of Guam to conduct some manager interviews. And um, last year we had a Pacific Islands Forestry Professionals Workshop where we had a lot of different stakeholders in the room and were able to do some initial needs assessments on what they're concerned about and you know where they'd like to see um, more work done. So um, based on that, we're doing some uh, MODIS fire and drought analysis with Clay Traurnick. Um, and uh, lot, lots more stuff to come. So uh, I especially want to thank Christian Giardino, Ryan Longman, Elliot Parsons, and Sierra McDaniel, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Abby Frazier. That was a really great summary of I know all the work that you've been doing. Um, I guess one of the questions uh, that's a little bit off of the direct science there, but how has uh, COVID and giving out, getting out and communicating with some of your managers um, been a challenge? I mean, it seems like a lot of the work that you're doing requires constant communication uh, to develop the knowledge exchange the way that you're hoping it will it will go and be used. So, how are you doing that, especially starting up a project that's focused more on the US API in remote islands? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question, and uh, it's definitely changed the the way that we're interacting with our partners. Um, you know, obviously, lots of Zoom, a lot more email contact. Um, you know, we'd love to be able to go back in person and just be able to brainstorm and workshop together. Uh, and so, yeah, looking forward in the US API, I mean, we're really relying heavily on our partners out there to um, really help connect us on the ground. But it's you know going to be virtual for the time being, and we're doing the best we can with that. So, yeah, it's it's but it is working well. I mean, we're still able to you know send files and get lots of great feedback back and forth. So great willing partners. Great, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any further questions coming in at the moment. If any of you out there have some, please do post them right now. Again, her Abby's information will be included in the documents that are part of our Science Summit, so you can always follow up. Um, I know that team that you have down on the slide there is doing some great work with drought and fire for our area or region, so thank you so much. It's great to see your presentation. Uh, wait, I do have one question that just came in. Can we come back to that? Um, you still there, Abby? Okay, sorry. Um, does lack of data for the US API region compared to Hawaii hinder work? And if so, how? Absolutely. We are relying on very different types of data for our analysis um, in the US API versus Hawaii. Um, I mentioned that for Hawaii, we have this 100 year gridded time series at 250 meter resolution where we can look at drought on different time scales and you know trying to produce something like that for the um, for the US API is going to be uh, very challenging just with you know the the sparse network of stations and the data gaps that are out there um, but we are working with what we have we're um, doing lots of you know quality control on the data we can get our hands on but this is why we're also looking at trying to incorporate other sources of data like remote sensing indices and seeing what we can tie um, from those you know large scale data sets to the on the ground measurements that we do have and yeah I'd love to echo what Tom said in one of his responses that we should definitely expand networks out in Guam and US API. <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully we can all work together to help do that especially when the timing is uh, the conditions are better for that as well so yes. Appreciate you answering that question. Um, thank you so much. And we are going to move to the next speaker. Um, Dr. Clay Charnick, a specialist at UH Manoa. Is Clay? I'm Clay here. is an associate specialist, thank you, in ecosystem fire with the UH Cooperative Extension and the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management. He is also the project lead for the Pacific Fire Exchange, a federally funded fire science communication project that seeks to make science useful for all the ground practitioners. Thank you so much for being here. Take it away. No worries. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd kind of do something a little bit different um, and give more of an overview of fire on Pacific Islands and how understanding the science of it really points towards adaptations. And I, I often think about fire um, as a useful way to think about um, fire, uh, climate adaptation in general, um, because 
it's not really rocket science. And this is a picture here from Manel Bay that um, we were just looking at with Patrick. This is Southern Guam. Um, so next slide, that fire was in 2019. And so you can think of fire at different scales, right? We can kind of think of the individual flame fire as a combustion process all the way up to that green triangle, which is like these longer term patterns of, of fire that we see over years and uh, in space. Next slide, please. And um, so thinking about that fire regime triangle, which is the idea of how the patterns of fire that we observe, there's really much like pretty much three drivers. Um, and you can just go to the next slide. Uh, we have human caused ignitions. So across the, all the Pacific islands, you can keep going actually, go, the, go two ahead and you can, I'll just throw them all up here. Um, human caused ignitions, right? So we're dealing with people. Uh, you can't avoid people dealing with fire in the Pacific islands. The changes in vegetation that we're seeing are the expansion of grasslands and savannas. Um, in Hawaii, this is kind of a recent phenomenon, but as I'll talk about in the other Pacific Islands, it's kind of ancient, um, goes going back quite a bit. And then this climate, uh, the issue of climate. So obviously fire is a function of climate. And we kind of have this double-edged sword in Hawaii and the Pacific where uh, we get lots of buildup of these grassy fuels when it rains. And then when it dries out, of course, uh, we get fire activity, uh, an increase in fire activity. And what we know about climate change is that it will make El Nino's, it's predicted to make El Nino's more intense and drought events more intense. Um, and it's also kind of going to screw up our ability to predict rainfall, right? So what the, the sort of incidence of these heavy rainfall events and drought events um, are going to become less predictable. And so we know that El Nino, for example, drives uh, really large fire incidents across, across the region. Next slide. Oh, wait, actually, back up. Back up one slide, please. And what the use of this triangle not is on, it's only not useful for science, but it's actually useful to understand where we can intervene um, from mitigation perspective, right? And so you can look at these three aspects and light locally, there's not a whole lot we can do about climate, but ignitions we can tackle through dealing with people, so public education and outreach. Um, and vegetation, it just comes down to vegetation management. And I really like how Elliot put this earlier. It's like, we can think about this in the sense of what are the landscapes uh, that we want to see. And by changing the vegetation on the landscape scale, we can actually change fire risk. It's actually the only way to directly change fire risk. So these are kind of simple tools. Uh, the problem is the scale at which you do it. And all of this depends on partnerships. So I'm really fortunate to work with folks like Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization on the Big Island, uh, various reserves, private landowners, watershed partnerships. I mean, at least we're it brings people together because we can agree that we want to see less fire in lots of cases. Um, and again, it's really, it provides tractable solutions in the sense of identifying uh, the mitigation strategies. Uh, implementing them is another, is another story. So uh, next slide, please. The impacts of grass, uh, grass fire cycle has really been characterized quite well in Hawaii. And this is kind of, I think for natural resource managers, the thing that most people think about, it's that repeated fires kind of allow that or cause forest cover to decline, right? So you get these repeated fires that sort of erode the edges of our watershed for us. And um, again, this is really how we frame uh, the impacts of fire across the region uh, on the terrestrial side. Of course, lots of um, sediment problems with, with fires exposing soils and things like that. So we have a pretty good um, idea of how fires also threaten marine resources as well. Next slide. And as I mentioned in Hawaii, this is kind of a recent phenomenon. So is it um, not really driven by climate uh, necessarily, but really this change in landscapes. And so we see this decline in agricultural land use. When we stop farming, we get lots and lots of grasslands and shrublands. And uh, that's really what correlates with this big spike in fire activity we've seen over the past uh, several decades. Next slide. When we move out to the Western Pacific, um, actually next slide, the, the patterns become a little bit different and where we get our fire activity, our big driver of fire activity is actually driven by the Asian monsoon. So as you get out to the Western Pacific, um, you get very, very pronounced dry seasons. And this is really what's driving the cyclical pattern of fires in places like Yap, Palau, Guam, uh, and the Marianas. So next slide. And as we can see, when we look at the area burned on these islands as a function of the, as a, as a proportion to their land area. So this is the percent 
uh, land area burn annually, the extent of fires on these islands dwarfs that of Hawaii um, and actually that of the continental US. So this is just giving some perspective about how much fire is happening in these areas, okay? Uh, next slide. And a lot of our understanding actually comes from some of the historical um, work that's been done on places like Guam, next slide, to try to understand what is driving these savanna uh, that, that we're dealing with. So the really extensive grasslands, savannas in Guam and a lot of these Western Pacific islands um, and that are their ancient ecosystems in the sense that they've been around there for a long time. Um, and so trying to wrap our heads around what's been going on, next slide. Uh, it really points us towards people. And this is the ignition source coming to play here. We know that while, or sorry, lightning strikes are very rare. This is a map of global lightning density. And so what's cool about this is that we know that fire histories started with the arrival of people on all of these islands. So fire is a cultural phenomenon on all, across the Pacific islands. Next slide. And uh, this is just a time series from some sediment cores that were done on Guam and it sort of flipped, but if you kind of go, these are savanna indicators, so charcoal and then savanna vegetation. And you can see around after 4,000 years before present, after human arrival, all of these indicators spike. And so what we're seeing with these, the extent of these savannas across a lot of these islands is, is actually like a cultural landscape. And this is kind of what, the reality is what we're dealing with today is the extent, the extent of these savannas uh, across all these islands. And so uh, next slide. Just to kind of give you, a, again, a, a picture of the scale, this is just four years of fires mapped on Guam, and you can see the, that extensive savanna in the south of Guam is really driving uh, the frequency of these fires. So land cover change combined with uh, human ignitions uh, is really driving, driving this problem. And just a couple more pictures of other, other islands to kind of, you guys get, get a sense of this, because we spend, uh, I think, a lot of time talking about this. Next slide is fine. Uh, so this is going to just some landscapes of southern Guam. You can keep going. Next slide. Um, so it really extensive grasslands, sword grass, and these sort of landscape mosaics. Uh, next slide. Saipan and Tinian, very similar, about 15% savanna cover across those islands. Next slide. And it results in similar patterns we see. So recurrent fires in the savannas. And what the other thing is, next slide, is that when you have this sort of intermix, Palau is a great example of this, of these savannas embedded within these forests, it creates a lot of forest edge. So when we get these dry, dry years during El Nino's, for example, that forest becomes highly vulnerable to burning. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is what it looks like on Bobble Dob and some of the, some of the savannas. Next slide. Uh, next slide, you can keep going through. This is just to give people a sense of what these landscapes look like. And Yap is very similar. Lots of savanna cover, um, sort of, and it runs up right against these forests. And in a typical year, the fire will try to self-extinguish. But again, it sort of primes these forested areas for being vulnerable um, to fire impacts on, on the dry years. Next slide. And here's for a kicker uh, on Yap. It even gets more interesting because when we look at these landscapes, you might be able to spot this out, but all of these furrows across those hills and these ditches, this entire landscape was cultivated farmland um, prior to European contact. So in other words, what we're seeing on Yap uh, may kind of mirror what we're experiencing now in Hawaii, where we see a decline in agriculture with as the human population crashed and sort of these expanding savanna uh, fire prone ecosystems. And with that, I think uh, that's my last slide. Maybe there's one more, a uh, couple more, one more, just showing uh, the landscape on, on Pala uh, sorry, on Yap in Le Mans. So with that, uh, I'll leave it open to questions. There's time. Thank you, Clay. Um, yeah, we have uh, time for one quick question, probably. I guess uh, we're starting to run short on time. We don't want to keep people too long, but uh, we do have a couple questions coming in. One is, was fire an important cultural practice on Guam and CNMI, or are there traditional cultural practices we should be considering? Totally. Um, so in YAP in particular, um, you know, you, you can talk to folks there and they will tell you about using fire to clear agricultural areas. I've had conversations with folks in Palau about burning to open access, you know, control insects. So there's tons of cultural uses. Um, the question becomes to what extent has that shifted, you know, under the, what, what we're, what, where we are now. And so, for example, in Guam, most of these fires are considered arson. They're tied to hunting um, 
And so, yeah, it's a fine line you have to walk. I mean, A, you can't probably stop all of these fires. And so does that open up some conversations to start having with, are there appropriate times to use fire in these ecosystems? All right. So in the end, it's a, it's a combination of drying conditions, cultural components, um, you know, of well, starting fires and so human ignition, change in, uh, change in land cover. And the seasonality and, though is kind of a, it makes it a little bit easy to deal with. Like we can anticipate these, these fires. We know every year when the dry season's coming. And so it gives us plenty of lead time, even for El Nino's, we have got lots and lots of lead time. It's just a matter of building capacity. And so when you talk about what the science means for management on the ground, how what options are there on the table to actually take action to reduce this risk and maybe prioritizing areas you want to protect maybe prioritize areas that we're not as concerned with and maybe it becomes a question of burning in the right times of the year to minimize um, to minimize those impacts great well thank you so much and thanks for all that great work and keeping to extend the pacific fire exchange we appreciate it yeah no problem thanks thank you all right, next up, we have Sierra McDaniel. Uh, so let's see, she is a botanist for the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. After graduating from UH Hilo, she started a two month position evaluating fire effects at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Nearly 20 years later, she serves as a botanist with the Division of Natural Resource Management. Her work focuses on forest restoration following cattle grazing rare and endangered plant recovery and post-fire rehabilitation. Thank you so much, Sierra. All right, thanks, Heather. Um, so over the past year, um, we've been working with Ryan Longman and Abby Frazier and Christian Giardina on this co-production project that um, Abby was explaining earlier, um, really to better understand the climate variability and drought at Hawaii volcanoes. Um, it's been a great experience getting to know these people and working on this project um, to really develop these customized project products for Hawaii volcanoes. Um, um, all of the graphs and charts um, that I'm going to be showing today were produced by Ryan Longman. He's really been the engine of this project and just wanted to start with a, um, a thank you to, to Ryan. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar, um, Hawaii Volcanoes is on the southeastern side of the island of Hawaii, uh, about 330,000 acres. So for context, this is just a bit smaller than the island of Oahu. So it's a pretty big um, land area and very diverse, wide range of conditions from the coast um, up to the summit of Mauna Loa, almost 14,000 feet. And the, um, the mission of the Park Service is to protect these diverse ecosystems um, for, for future generations. And um, fire is certainly one of, of our challenges to meeting, to meeting this mission. Um, over the last few decades, fires have certainly become larger and more frequent. Um, on this map, you can see the expanse, the spread of the fires across um, the area that's the Toy Volcanoes now. And what our experience has been is just what Clay was talking about, is you have repeated fires and you get a conversion from, from forests to non-native grasslands for much of the Ohia woodlands. Um, in addition to that, we also have dozens of species that really are on the brink of extinction um, with just a handful um, left. One highlighted here is how Kuahivi, um, only found at Hawaii Volcanoes, was reduced to a single plant and also some globally threatened um, ecosystems like Kipuka Key is the other picture you see here. Both of these um, almost burned in 2018. So that just gives you um, kind of an idea of what we're what we're trying to protect. And so given these resources, given these experiences that we've had with fire um, and the high value resources, we do have a total um, fire suppression policy within the park. Um, and we have some really good strategies, but these can be refined and improved um, through the use of best um, available science. Next slide. 
So we have a lot of factors that actually contribute to a fire occurring and the fire spreading. So weather and climate, people, um, fuels, how we manage them, our suppression tactics. Um, and the park has really had a significant investment um, in, in this over, the, over many, many years. Um, and we do have a great influence over a lot of these factors, but we need the data to be able to, um, to guide these actions. And so that's why this um, opportunity was so great for us to be able to partner um, with these folks. And, um, and through this, we were able to create different products for different spatial and temporal scales to make these management decisions. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, um, so the, the focus was on describing um, the, the climate change, climate variability, and drought. And at uh, the beginning, we spent um, a, quite a bit of time learning each other's languages, what kind of management is happening um, at Hawaii Volcanoes. And like Abby was explaining, it's a very iterative process um, where there was like, okay, we can do this, and then um, a lot of back and forth. Um, and one of the first steps was really figuring out what's a meaningful spatial scale. And this was particularly important to me as a lot of the projects maybe, or a lot of the products that are available, they might be on an island scale or maybe the windward or leeward side of the island. And it's always hard to tell when you have a land area that you're trying to manage, um, how applicable are those products for your exact, um, exact area. So the map you see is, is what we ended up with. Um, we started with um, the fire management units that have been used for decades. And then these were then subdivided into climate units. So for instance, like the subalpine management unit, um, from a fuels perspective, it may be very similar, the type of vegetation that's there. But from a climate um, perspective, it could be different with different seasonalities and different um, times of drought and that sort of thing. So this, um, the analysis was done for each of the 12 climate units. And this resulted in a pretty big um, set of data and the portfolio that Abby was referring to. Um, and at times, this is a little bit painful for, for Ryan. You know, you make one change and you have to go back and change everything for these um, these 12 units, but he survived with a good, good attitude and, um, and created really a useful template for now their project for scaling up for, for other areas. And this portfolio really has a lot of applicability for lots of areas of park management, invasive species, um, control, fencing, um, restoration, visitor experience. There's a long list, but Today, I wanted to particularly focus on the role of um, drought and fire management. Next slide. Okay, um, so we have the spatial scale, but then we still needed to um, different metrics on different um, temporal scales to make um, different types of decisions. Um, just to illustrate a little bit, it's a subset of the data um, that was put together. I'm gonna focus on one of those management units. It's this um, mid-elevation seasonal Kilauea, which has um, had a lot of fires in that area. Um, and one metric that we got um, pretty excited about for the short term is consecutive dry days. Um, so this had never really been mapped out for, um, for the park on this type of level. Um, and this chart that you're seeing, it has this, this consecutive dry days for months per month for each of these, um, for this unit. Um, and this is where you're gonna get short-term drying events. And so like what Clay was saying with the grasses, this is our fine fuels. And the fine fuels are gonna be drying out over these short time periods, which may not show up in um, you know, the US drought monitor or something like that. Um, so we're, what we're hoping is we can use this kind of information with some of our traditional um, like a drought metrics, like the KBDI or the or ERC, like the energy release component that we're already using to help refine some of um, the information um, that we can use. And, and we hear Clay is working on, um, on a real-time fire danger product. So we're hoping that we would be able to have some kind of a notification system to get this data in real time. Um, so this can help with um, all kinds of prep with 
closure closures, staffing, or if we do have a fire, any kind of post fire restoration. Next slide. Um, so we're also making um, uh, management decisions on a seasonal time frame, um, but the metrics that we need are different. And just recently, Ryan was taking a look at fire and drought data, um, really to get at the history of the interaction between um, fires and what type of drought period um, that, that's occurring. And it's a little bit difficult with fire because there are so many factors that go into um, Okay, so I'm a little bit short on time here. Um, but anyways, this is um, it also related to, to the ENSO. Okay, just next slide. Um, and this will just be my last one, but the, the final scale that we're working on is on a de decadal scale. And so um, the, we really need this for long-term planning. Um, you can see the increase in drought intensity over time on the on the left and then on the right um, we're looking at different downscaling products so that you can um, you can really look at what or estimate what the change is going to be and so there's they don't always agree but the bottom line is it's getting drier everywhere um, and we can use that information to make decisions about um, fuel break management um, how we manage special ecological areas and restoring um, restoring post fire. So, um, you know, we don't have all the answers and exactly what path we're headed on, but really engaging in this type of research um, allows us to get closer to where we want to be. And that's to be able to effectively manage these lands um, in an uncertain future and really shift and change how that story, um, story ends. So, all right, thank you. And I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Sierra. I really appreciate um, your presentation. Um, we are running out of time. I know we want to uh, try to get people out at the time that we said so on the agenda, but I did want to encourage you, uh, were all the attendees or any of the panelists to submit a question to the Q&A and we can ask Sierra to check that um, to see if she can answer anything there. I did want to let you know too, there are a couple comments of people just really interested in learning more from you or setting up a partnership particularly related to potential restoration areas infested with guinea grass. Um, so if you are able to uh, get on the Q&A, that would be great and probably our best move for now so we could uh, we could move good. to the final speaker. All right, sounds good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that, yeah, thanks for understanding that. Okay, and our last speaker for uh, today, day one of our summit is Dr. Tracy Wagner from the, she's a marine science professor at UH Hilo. Um, and is the director of the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science Program. Her research focuses on the connection between the land and ocean, specifically focusing on how terrestrial freshwater inputs affect nearshore water quality and biological processes. At UH Hilo, she teaches courses on global change, watersheds, chemical oceanography, and a scientific method, as well as mentoring undergrad and graduate students on research projects. Thanks for uh, being here to, to wrap it up for us. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here today. I promise to make it worth your while. Next slide, please. So here, um, here in Hawaii, the effects of climate change have already been documented, including changes in precipitation and sea level rise. Over the last 30 years, Hawaii has seen a decline in rainfall with widely varying patterns across the island. It's projected that Hawaii's will have a drier climate with more extreme rain events causing flash flooding in the future. Sea level has also risen and by the end of the century may rise by one meter. Today I will share our findings from research that shows both how changes in precipitation and sea level rise are affecting water quality and how that can directly impact human health. Next slide. As previously mentioned, precipitation changes have already been documented in Hawaii with a general trend towards a drier climate with increasing frequency of extreme rain events. And this will have impacts to coastal water quality. On the top panel are results from the Wailuku River 
that show that as rainfall increases along the y along the x axes the export of pathogens to estuaries increase and we can see this here for staphylococcus aureus a pathogen that causes severe skin infections on the bottom panel, we see that the pathogen export is affected by preceding river flow conditions. When a rain event occurs after a rainy period, the export of pathogens to coastal waters is lower than when the rain event is preceded by a dry period. In fact, the longer the dry period before the rain event, the greater the export of the pathogen to the estuary. This means that the risk of a Staphylococcus aureus infection from recreational water use will become greater in the future under projected climate conditions. Next slide. So our research revealed that there are non-point sources of the pathogens within the watershed. So to reduce the export, we need to identify those sources. We've collected samples from wastewater, urban runoff, and soils. For soils, we've collected samples from a variety of different land uses within the Hilo Bay watershed, including forest, agriculture, and urban areas. Through the analysis of soil pathogen concentrations and mapping them out by land use, we're able to identify pathogen soil hotspots. From the two maps we have here, you can see that land use with the highest soil staph aureus concentrations are in urban areas, largely surrounding Hilo Bay, with the second highest soil concentrations seen in agricultural areas. While we can't alter the precipitation patterns with our own, um, our own or local government actions, we can mitigate the export of the pathogens by working with natural resource managers to develop plans to reduce soil erosion and runoff during storms, particularly in areas with high soil pathogen concentrations. Next slide. So in order to do this work, there have been many different partners and funding agencies, many of which were shown on the title slide, but more partners can um, come to the table to put our findings into action. And this would include organizations like the Hawaii Department of Health, various watershed partnerships, PAC-IOs, and USGS. The latter two are important for our next steps in this research, which is to develop a real-time prediction system for safe swimming conditions relative to water pathogen concentrations. Uh, we plan to do this using relationships we've developed between pathogen concentrations in the water and parameters like turbidity and salinity, parameters that can be measured in real time by a water quality buoy. The ultimate goal is to reduce human health risks arising from changes in precipitation patterns. Next slide. So as previously mentioned, another impact from climate change is sea level rise. Um, sea level has already risen and by the end of the century may rise up to one meter. Uh, and this will also impact coastal water quality. In Hawaii, many homes dispose of their wastewater through on-site sewage disposal systems, OSDS, many of which are cesspools. Uh, cesspools are essentially unlined holes in the ground where the untreated wastewater makes its way through the porous basalt into the water table and then ultimately out to the ocean. For those of you who are not familiar with wastewater, it's a wonderful mixture of human pathogens, nutrients, and any other household chemicals that go down your drains. So it can obviously have tremendous impacts to both human and ecosystem health. As sea level rises, um, more um, OSDSs will be inundated, especially in coastal communities. And this will increase the amount and the speed at which untreated wastewater is entering into the ocean. Here uh, we have pictures from Puko, a coastal community here on Hawaii Island. 
The Oceanside homes are three to 10 meters um, from the ocean. Uh, presently at high tide, some homeowners um, have reported that their cesspools will overflow into their backyards. Um, contractors have reported that when they are installing new and improved OSDSs, um, they're actually being placed into the water table because the water table is that close to the surface of the ground. Um, the far right figure shows the projected sea level rise for Puuko by the end of, a of the century with a rise in one meter. Um, more OSDSs will be inundated with seawater causing more untreated wastewater to enter the ocean and potentially have greater impacts to human and ecosystem health. Next slide, please. So today we've mapped out shoreline hotspots of sewage pollution using a variety of sewage indicators. Here we have a map looking at stable nitrogen isotopes for nitrate. Um, any circles from yellow to red indicate levels that are indicative of sewage pollution. We've also sampled wells from within the watershed to try to identif identify a specific location that sewage is entering into the water table. And then to top it off, we've done some dye tracer tests um, to demonstrate the connection between the OSDS um, and the ocean and to show how fast it can actually travel. Uh, next steps for our research include taking this baseline water quality data and combining it with sea level rise maps to determine OSD inundation and predict water quality changes. Um, these results have been and will continue to be shared with stakeholders to make informed decisions regarding OSDS and other options for collecting and treating wastewater. Um, this approach has now been applied to new locations beyond Puuco, including Hilo, Pompeii in the Federated States of Micronesia, and we hope in the future to include Kailua Kona. Next slide. So as you can see here, again, so many partners and funding agencies to make this research possible. Uh, the next step would include bringing county and state to the table to understand how sea level rise will impact OSDS and water quality. And one thing that I wanna mention for both of these research efforts, um, one of the challenges is really finding the right partners to address the questions, as well as to employ or develop new tools to better answer the questions and provide meaningful information um, for decision-making. And then one last issue I just wanted to bring to your attention, um, not just an issue with these two projects, but with other projects that I've been involved in, is the mindset of researchers, institution, and funding agencies, where we have these artificial boundaries between terrestrial, freshwater, and marine systems. And we really need to remove those because it's hindering our interdisciplinary research. And I want us to, to encourage all of us to think more broadly across these boundaries in order for us to more holistically um, deal with the challenges of climate change. Um, in particular for the research that I presented today, um, we really need to, to address that interaction between climate, environment, and human health. And lastly, I just wanna thank all of the students who make this research possible. Um, because without them, I would never be able to get anything done. So mahalo for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wagner. You could uh, turn your video back on if you'd like. And I do encourage people again, I know we're running out of time, but if you do have a question to go ahead and post it in the Q&A and we can have the panelists uh, look at them and try to get back to you. Um, I did, uh, let's see, we do have one question for you. And um, that was what some, well, you mentioned that you, some of the managers are trying to suggest ways to reduce erosion in the areas where there are high levels of pathogens. Has there been any uh, successful method designed to help reduce erosion from those areas? Well, we, this is just what we have found out most recently. We haven't gotten to that next step of 
um, sharing this information with managers. We've just recently have developed those map, um, maps that have allowed us to identify where the hot spots are in the watershed for pathogen accumulation. Um, that next step is really sharing it with people who employ techniques to help control erosion and see if it's possible. Um, the USGS in the Great Lakes region has applied some of those techniques and have found that they have been able to reduce the loads going into the Great Lakes. A great, thanks for clarifying that because uh, yeah, the presentation was a, a bit disheartening about uh, all the different pathogens and wastewater uh, materials that are running into the water. And so that leads to one other question we had before uh, we start to wrap up is, do you have any idea how resilient our coral reefs are to OSDS inundation? I think they can't, if, if we are able to take these local actions to improve water quality, I think the reefs can be more resistant to the more global stressors like um, increases in sea surface temperature and ocean acidification. Um, research has shown um, really one of the first places where sewage pollution research was studied in great detail in Kaneohe Bay, that when they redirected the um, outfall, the reefs were able to recover within four, 10, 20 years, they were able to come back. And so if we were able to take off those local stressors, the reefs should hopefully be a little more resilient to some of the global ones. Yeah, let's hope so. So <laughs> thank you for answering those questions. Um, again, all the speaker information will be placed in our, um, in the documents that we'll be sharing with everybody. The Q&A is still open for now as I, um, I'm going to hand it back over to, to Darren Lerner, but I wanted to really thank all of our, our uh, lightning talks. Uh, you guys have really brought to the table some huge climate challenges in Hawaii and across the Pacific, setting us up for some great conversation uh, for day two and in our breakout sessions, but also just in general as all of us who are involved in this summit are thinking more about um, how we can work together to adapt to changing climate. So thank you so much for bringing your research to the table. And I'm going to pass it I'll back over to Darren Lerner. Thank you, Heather. Um, and, and I want to add my thanks to all the speakers too. Just an, um, um, fantastic talks. Thank you so much. And, and I just can't help but think and state the obvious that, man, if we could all just be together, um, this could be a little bit more interactive. And I really appreciate um, you know, we had uh, still, even though we're running a little bit late, we still have about 100 people with us. And I really appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to join us. And I welcome you back tomorrow. Thank you so much and have a great evening.